He was very friendly with everybody. He was on the school board. He held a, a township office for a while, but then was not reelected. He and his wife, Nellie, had a beautiful farm about a quarter of a mile west of Bath. So there was a lot of money there, and the school um, started wanting more things, raising more taxes, and so Kehoe was really getting very, very angry by now. He was already, had difficult financial difficulties. He had difficulties at home. Kehoe was very experienced in doing several things, maintenance and, and repair work and stuff, especially with wiring. Because he had access, he was somewhat of a janitor on the school board. He had access to that building and he began wiring it with dynamite, which sounds bizarre in today's world, but dynamite back then was readily available. We put dynamite and pyrotol in the walls and under the floors, and he planted a total of 1,000 pounds of dynamite. He set the timer to go off at 8.45 in the morning, May 18th. It was the last real school day of the year. He was going to get rid of the kids and get back at the parents and teach them a lesson. He also had planted dynamite in his house, all his barns, all around his area. The morning it went off, he first began doing damage to his own farm, killing animals, things like that. And Later it was found out he had killed his spouse and left her body on the farm. And then he went up to the school and was greeting the children as they walked in. The first timer went off. Kehoe had left by this time. Nobody remembered hearing the boom of the explosion. And I think that's just part of the trauma. They said the floor went up and the ceiling came down. Because of that explosion, it jarred the timer on the other half of the school. So that timer did not go off, only by the grace of God. That end of the school did not blow up. Had it blown up, the whole building would have gone. When Kehoe drove back up by the school and saw Mr. Hike, who was his main person he wanted dead, he was standing out in the yard helping. Kehoe drove his truck up to the front of the school. He had filled the back end of his truck with shrapnel, metal, pieces of metal, shards of glass, whatever he could find, and put some dynamite in there. He drove up and uh, got out, and called Mr. Hike over to the truck, and shot into the back of the truck and blew it up, killing himself. Mr. Hike, the postmaster, there was one little boy who had survived. The explosion in the school was out in the yard and was killed when the truck blew up. Reports were you could hear it as far as Lansing, and people began emerging on the scene almost immediately. I want the wind to They worked all day digging bodies and children out. Uh, they were getting blankets and sheets and whatever they could find for bandages, blankets to cover the bodies. Parents would come up looking for their children. Sometimes they were so mangled they had to just look at their shoes to identify them that way. Funerals started Friday, and there would be like five or six a day, and people that had lost children would go to the funerals of their friends to help support them. It's just heartbreaking, because like one family lost three children. That's a whole branch of that family that's, that's died out. It's not gonna grow. My dad and my two aunts were buried under the rubble. My dad was in the third grade. He said when he came to, all he could see was a little light shining up above him. 
He kept calling out for the janitor to come and help. Nobody came, nobody heard him. And the next thing he knew, he was being pulled from the rubble. He had plaster in his ears, in his mouth, his nose, his eyes, everywhere. He had blood, he had injuries, you know, little lacerations all over him. Um, later on, it was discovered he had broken his leg. I had a good father, raised good. He was taking a test and he was on the lower floor and the top floor had come down on him. He was, was one of the last ones that they took out. And, uh, you know, uh, he said, I, he said, I thought I heard somebody say, well, we're done, guys, let's go. Didn't say anything about that day for years to me or anybody else. There was a lot of uh, trauma, and I think there was a lot of children of that age at that time uh, growing up in life that didn't talk about it too much. I'd ask him a question once in a while, and he'd open up a little bit about it. He was in the hospital probably for three or four months, I guess, uh, and uh, part of his skull was busted out from the dynamite, and he had a metal plate put in his, in his shins because he lost part of that. Finally, the doctors told, told, told his mother and dad, you might just well take him home, put him in his own bedroom, and, you know, you know, if he's going to die, let him die in his own bed. Well, that was kind of traumatic for my dad to hear. My dad would start crying sometimes. Anytime anyone talked to him about it, he would start crying, even as an adult. They just didn't talk about it. They held everything in. They didn't have support groups back then. They didn't have psychologists that would come out and help people. But we need people to know about it because it is a part of Bath. It's a part of our history. I believe there's evil in the world. Evil runs the world. I have no doubt about that. As I got older, then I started finding out more, especially when Daddy wrote the book about the township. His brother was about three years older than him, and the kids would pick on him and Floyd would come along and protect him, chase off the bullies and protect Dad. His brother was killed in the explosion. He was very proud of Floyd and he really missed him when he was gone. Aunt Gertie, when she was buried in the rubble, someone kept kicking her. And they kicked and kicked, kind of a rhythmic kicking. It wasn't uh, fast, and I don't think it was very hard. And after a while, she just said, would you please quit? And they did quit because they died. I don't know if that child suffered. I, it was a quick explosion, so I pray that they all most all quickly died. Second generation of kids, what they remember is their parents never talked about it and never allowed it to be talked about in the house. That whole generational grief is something that's pretty remarkable and I think we're just starting to understand it. I think that this has to live on through us kids. We, we, need, to, we need to see that they're recognized. We need to tell the story and it just, it wasn't told before. It wasn't told by them as much as it should have been. They deserve to be remembered. There were many survivors and went on to live wonderful lives, have families, and I don't think it should be buried. They shouldn't be forgotten. I can't imagine losing little children. I mean, most of the kids were seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven years old. And they were the future of the community.
Every moment as my guide.